we know that he was born in El Paso, and so in, 18, in 1895, and he was baptized there, but very quickly came to Peoria and was a student at the cathedral school. Uh, and not only was he a student there, uh, but he even served in the cathedral. I know that's an important part of your story. With so for my students, I've taught fifth grade through eighth grade and most of my career. And so a lot of them are altar servers. And by far, one of their favorite stories of Fulton Sheen's life is when he was an altar server in the cathedral for Bishop Spalding and he dropped the wine cruet. And they, they just... It's like he becomes real to them because, you know, he was a kid who made mistakes, who drops things. And so that story really is warm and kind of engages them. And then, of course, then you go on and say what happened afterwards when he goes back to the sacristy and expects to get, you know, in big trouble. But instead, the bishop says, you know, where are you going to go to school when you get big? And he says, oh, you know, Spalding Institute, thinking, you know, the school named after him. But then the bishop says, no, you're going to go to Louvain and you'll become as I am. And the fact that both of those things came true, that he went to Louvain University and became a bishop, it just kind of blows their mind. So that's one of their favorite stories it's about such him. such an amazing uh, work of the Holy Spirit that that was said at that time. Um, so Fulton Sheen did graduate uh, in Peoria uh, from high school and he went on to college seminary and major seminary in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And after that, he was ordained in 1919 in the same cathedral where that same incident occurred. Uh, and then he was sent for studies. So he did go to Louvain and um, studied in Belgium. And then he studied at the Sorbonne in Paris and then at the Angelicum in Rome. So probably one of the most educated men uh, in the Diocese of Peoria at that time. So he came back to the diocese and he was ready to do his work to start teaching. And that was what he had been prepared for. And Bishop Dunn at the time was the one who assigned him. He says, yep, I'm assigning you to a parish. And so he was sent to St. Patrick's Parish on the uh, what now is the south side of Peoria. And a real testament to Sheen is that um, he wasn't just an academic who was just ready to stand and lecture in a classroom, but he was someone who could take all of that knowledge that he had. And he employed it in a very successful way, ministering in that parish. So it was a short time, and Bishop Dunn even kind of said it was a test. He was testing to see if he would be obedient. Um, but he was very successful in drawing souls to Christ. So not just in the classroom, but um, all also in the pews and in the pulpit and in the parish. And then after that, he was released for Catholic University where he taught in the philosophy department. Uh, so from 1926 on, he was at Catholic University. But he was also began to be recognized for his work in media, which characterized so much of his life. Uh, being on radio, beginning in 1930, he started the Catholic Hour, uh, a program that he would do on radio for Catholics. But as time would go on, uh, he would then be appointed to work for the missions, so the propagation of the faith in 1950. He became a, a bishop, an auxiliary bishop in New York in 1951, and then started uh, probably the more famous of the programs, not on radio, but this time on television, Life is Worth Living. Um, and he was so successful that uh, he even received accolades. I mean, he won that. an Emmy for yeah. it, which was like unheard of at the time and really hasn't happened since. So I love that. I mean, he had 30 million viewers often. I mean, in play times when, you know, not even everyone had a television, let alone multiple televisions in their home, that he had so many viewers, Catholics and non-Catholics alike, which really captures the attention, I think, of people today as well. And uh, having to go up against Milton Berle. Now, young people have no idea who Milton Berle is, but that he was quite the figure back at the time. So to even outperform Milton Berle, I know we're going to tell some of his jokes later, but um, one of the things that he would say with that, he'd say, well, he can't really uh, say that he was the one that outperformed Milton Berle. He had to give all the credits to his writers. Matthew, you know. Mark, Luke, and John, exactly. of course. Yes. <laughs> so that, was, that was a great line that he had. So, uh, following the, his time in Life is Worth Living, um, we know that he also um, had to work with uh, Cardinal Spellman, and that was um, some difficult times we'll say more about as well. Uh, but then the Vatican, uh, Second Vatican Council opened, and he was a council father. Uh, so he participated in all the sessions from 1962 to 65, and he met a certain uh, archbishop at the time, Carol Wotiwa, later um, uh, Pope John Paul II, and even um, uh, Ratzinger was one of the expert theologians. So he actually met two, uh, these two men in the course of Vatican II, which was remarkable. Um, after Vatican II finished, he was then uh, he came back and was then assigned to Rochester, to the Diocese of Rochester, where he served for three years, uh, where. In all honesty, what everyone seems to say is he was an utter failure. And we will come back to that, I know, too. So we'll have some things to say about that. Maybe he wasn't as much of a failure, I think, as, as the reputation was at the time. Um, but he retired in 1969. 
And after all of those years on television, on radio, being a bishop, um, he retired into somewhat of a life of a certain obscurity. Um, he would speak, he would write, he would go around and give retreats in particular, uh, but never with the same amount of fame as uh, what he had uh, initially in the, in the heyday that was there until really the very last year of his life, the last couple of months of his life, in fact, uh, when there was such an important incident. So Carol Oitia, who was the newly elected Pope John Paul II, came to visit the United States in October, I think, of 1979. And Fulton Sheen was there, but he wasn't with the main group. He was kind of over on a side chapel. And so Pope John Paul II asked to see Fulton Sheen. So he was taken over to him. And, you know, Fulton Sheen went to, to kneel down before him to, to show this honor and respect to the new pontiff. But Pope John Paul II kind of grabbed his elbows and pulled him up and, and hugged him. And I can't watch, like, there's a short clip that you can see video of that or the photos of it. I can't watch that without tearing up because then we know that Pope John Paul II, you know, whispered in his ear, you know, you are a loyal son of the church. You have written and spoken well of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, to hear that just a couple of months before he would eventually, you know, he would pass away just a couple months later. I mean, that had just had to be a capstone at the end of his life to, to receive that embrace of Pope John Paul II, to hear those words. Uh, I just had to, had to be such a powerful moment for him. And then he uh, died on December 9th, 1979 in his chapel. So even at prayer um, on the day after the Immaculate Conception, uh, being so close to Our Lady. So I know that was important to him as well.